Welcome to Rudy Cosmic Soul Storytime. This is a pre-story trigger warning. This story references choice, sex, and sexuality from a stark black, lesbian, Gen X, cis woman perspective. If you find these to be sensitive topics or identities from your perspective, this may not be your story. Please use your discretion in choosing to move forward. This is a tale called For Black Lesbian Women When the Paradigm Ain't Enough by D.B. Vesquez. I decided to kill myself on the new moon. It seemed to make sense. A fresh start somewhere else. Also, I guess I wanted to do it in the dark of night. My sole companion, the stars, seemed most appropriate. I mean, I was planning to return whence I came. I spent a few days preparing, wrapping up a handful of loose ends. I sat outside and penned my last thought. Noticing I could hear the approach of westerly winds before I could feel them, as if they were ushering in a change. Yeah, well, I got a change for you already. I wrote a dozen handwritten letters and addressed the envelopes. A couple of days earlier, as I was looking through old shoeboxes, stashed memories, I found a box of love stamps. Seemed right to use those. Stamped and licked, I placed the envelopes in the mailbox and moved on down my before-you-kill-yourself list. I already cleaned the house. No reason to leave a messy home. That's just mean. Next on my list, the giveaways. Alma always coveted that butterfly quilt, so that's for her. Amaris always played with the hand-sized meditative balance balls living room when she came over. Sierra was always borrowing books. More than often, she never returned them. She wasn't a thief or anything. I always found them on her bookshelf while she simply offered a blushing girl. She would have them all now. The vintage beer mugs were to be beans. Finney gets the iPad and MacBook and I left all of my button-down short and long sleeve shirts to Anne. As I was folding and boxing the shirts, I noticed there was one missing, the navy blue and pink striped flannel. Anne thought I looked like a proper black butch in that one. I went to the hall closet and rummaged in there to no avail. I checked the back of my truck, nothing. The backyard, nothing. Where in the world was that shirt? It was a mutual favorite that I wore all the time. For the life of me, literally, I could not find it. I thought I'd check my bedroom closet one last time. As I was rustling through the clothes, pressed long sleeve shirts and dress slacks from a day job now long in the past, I heard something shift or move toward the back of the closet. I guess if I'm going to have a mouse, now is the time. I could nibble on my dead, lifeless body until someone eventually came calling, wondering what the fuck I was. I was about to just leave it be, but my curiosity got the best of me. I shut the closet door and grabbed my bat from the other room. When I returned, I heard it again. There was definitely something in there, for sure. I gently and ever so slowly opened the closet door again, and then swiftly, with one hand, pulled the lower rung of clothes back towards me, bat in the other hand. I could have sworn I saw something shimmy back into the corner shadows. What the fuck? Whatever it was, it was for damn sure not a mouse. It seemed bigger. But how could a possum or raccoon get in my closet? I jabbed my bat into the corner, hard the end of it ramming my palm, causing a deft pain to run up my forearm. But nothing was there. Okay, I thought, it must be the two pills I took kicking in. 
And at that, I gave up the hunt. Anne would have to find it after I was gone. I finished packing the box and labeled everything. That was that. The sun was going to set soon, and I wanted to smoke a joint and drink some whiskey while taking it in. My last sunset. Death was no reason to balk at the majesty of nature, but I had to get a move on it. The movement of time felt relentless. The last thing on my before-you-kill-yourself list was to check all the closets, under all the beds, for the things that might embarrass Mom. Starting at the back of the house, I found nothing since I had already obsessively cleaned. I searched my bedroom last. I knew the two places I'd check first. The side night table near my bed had a hidden compartment. From there, I pulled out the shoebox that held dental dams never used, because, well, I'm me, a pussy-loving lesbian. No way one of me created those. Dental dams were a vagina-loving lesbian's enemy. I found old, unopened condoms, lube, and quite a few latex gloves. The purple ones, of course. I smiled and sighed, remembering my 20s and 30s. Oh, where has the time gone? The last box was safely tucked under my bed, which held all my old vibrators, dildos, and various harnesses. Although I lived alone, I was so racked with shame and fear, I still hid my nasty sex stuff. Even from myself. And that was one reason I had decided enough was enough. This world, so controlling and constricting, no matter how hard I tried, never let up. Therapy didn't help. Drugs didn't help. People didn't help. Education and social media only made it worse. No matter how much I tried to break free, to tell my mind I was enough, to tell my thoughts to stop swirling in a frenzy leading to various levels of self-hate, I always landed in a joyless heap of tears and pain. I was too black, too female, too queer, too poor for this fucked up white male capitalist construct. I bent down along the side of the bed and lifted the edge of the comforter. As I knelt deeper, I ran my arm back and forth. Nothing. I stretched even further, and that's when something touched my fingers was warm, possibly moist. I fell back, hitting my head on the nightstand as I went down. Trying to shake it off, I rolled on my side and grabbed the bat still sitting by the closet door. My brain screamed, there was something in the closet. But how the hell did it get from the closet to underneath the bed? I hopped on top of the bed with my bat in hand. My plan was to lift quickly the comforter and swipe the fuck out of whatever it was. One, two, three. I swung the side of the comforter up and violently waved the bat left to right like a mad woman. As I hit the hidden box, I heard it slide across the floor, and then I heard a thump and a cranky voice say, Ouch. Watch it, will ya? When I tell you I almost died of fright right then and there, I am not being hyperbolic. I scrambled to the middle of the bed and laid there on my back, too scared to move. Had I lost my mind? I've taken these pills before, but this ain't never happened. What the fuck just spoke from underneath my bed in that earthy, crackling, old-ass voice? I couldn't move. I just laid there hugging my back. My phone was in the other room, but who the hell was I going to call and say what? Oh, hi. I know I'm supposed to be out of town, but I'm home and about to kill myself. And something that talks and sounds way fucked up is underneath my bed. Could you maybe come and help? I didn't realize, but in my extreme and frozen response to fear, I was speaking aloud. Well, that's rude, it said. Who's fucked up? You're the one swinging that bat and taking pills. Sheesh, these humans, I tell ya. That's it, I've gone crazy, I said. Yeah, <laughs> and batty too, it cackled. I just laid there, 
I mean, what would you do? I searched my mind for possible outs, but everything required me moving and that was not happening. My body became my enemy. Trapped there, just me, a bat and this thing under my bed. The sun set and the room darkened. I needed to turn the lamp on, but as previously mentioned, I couldn't move. I laid there, fucked. All I could do was just lay there. I felt like one of those white women in horror flicks that hear a noise outside their secluded country home and they go outside to check it. All the while, all the black folks in the theater are like, that's some dumbass shit. Stay in the house, get your gun. We know y'all love your guns. But instead, all the black folks were yelling at me, get up and get out. The intruder beneath my bed interrupted my thoughts and said, all right, Batty, I'm gonna come out. You're not gonna freak out. Just going to breathe. I'm not here to hurt you. I heard it shuffling, shifting, and it seemed to breathe with some exertion. As it moved, it said under its breath, these damn humans always making it a dangerous adventure. So violent to bear. Then it said more clearly, I'm gonna come out and walk to the middle of the room and let you take a look. As the end of the comforter ruffled, my mind scrambled, my eyes closed involuntarily. Fucking woman up, Althea. I took a deep breath and opened my eyes. There was the ceiling, as always, now cast in the darkness of dusk come and gone. I took another breath and forced myself to pull in my legs and sit up. Standing in front of me, oh my fucking God, breathe. Standing in front of me at the foot of the bed was a creature less than a foot tall. There was so much to take in. It looked like a cross between a human and a thickly barked deep brown tree trunk. I just stared at it. The words I thought were, what are you? But what came to my mouth was, did I smoke that giant already? These children in there play with plants. They just have no idea. Maybe you did and maybe you didn't. It shuffled again boosting up its skirts, or perhaps trousers. Filled with more curiosity than fear at this point, I inched my neck forward and took all of whatever it was. It was only about a foot tall, give or take an inch. It looked female, whatever it was. At the top of her head was a lopsided, brilliantly white head wrap, wobbled as she shifted her weight. Her hair, a salty white, was falling around her face in what looked like thousands of perfectly, intricately tight braids. She had deep, almond-shaped eyes. The irises were lavender, encircled in marigold yellow. They were in stark contrast to her painted white and red-striped and dotted face. Her nose was wide and her lips thick. Dangling from her mouth was a long wooden pipe that greenish-colored smoke lightly wafting up into the air. Wrapped around her neck were too many to count, many colored beads. They looked astonishingly like leques, the sacred beads of the Orisha tradition. Her arms were short and very muscular. Her slightly hairy forearms and her fingers resembled short little tree branches. Her upper body was covered in a black shawl atop a navy blue fabric, and still beneath that another cloth of majestic purple. The lower half was clad in jet black trousers that could only be seen at what were maybe her ankles. It was all held there loosely by a yellow belt that perfectly matched her eyes. On her feet, that looked just like her fingers, only sturdier, were wooden, laced up, clunky sandals. It was a wonder she didn't topple over. She looked like a pint-sized black African grandmother. Did you get a good look, Batty? She asked, puffing on her pipe and placing a hand at her hip as if she was striking a pose. 
What in God's name are you? I stammered out. What? That's an easy one. I'm a servant of the goddess Allah, as in A-L-A. She spelled out. No double L here. A god, as you say, has nothing to do with us. I have been charged with your transition. We can see your decision is made. So structured are you. You sound like Yoda, but look like the blackest female version of Gnome I've ever seen. Batty, where do you think those white folks stole the idea? But I am no fantasy, and this isn't an epic novel of appropriated myths. I am the real deal. I am what we call a Raiz. My name is Idinkira Raiz. It is a pleasure to meet you, she said as she brought her hands up to her throat next to her lips where she planted a small kiss and then to her third eye touching there. At that point, she lifted her head so her eyes could touch. Her eyes held such depth and love. It was overwhelming. She stared into me and I wondered what she saw. She kept hold of my eyes for a long moment then slowly closed hers and methodically lifted her head a bit more, moving her palms, hands and thumbs down to her chin. Her head wrap wobbled, and her necklaces clanked against the dozen bracelets she was also wearing. Why are you here? I asked. Still not paying attention, huh? I told you to help you with your transition. My transition? The pills, nightly prayers asking for strength, before you kill yourself list. I thought you'd be further along the tracks by now. Train's just a little slow, huh? But why haven't I heard of you before? I asked, inching across the bed to watch her as she shuffled toward my dresser. She was pulling the drawers open one by one, climbing up. When she got to the top, she picked up this and that, examining and smelling the rings, little boxes, coin jar, lotion, oils that sat there. Well... There are these little things I believe you all referred to as white supremacy and patriarchy. Sure does a damn good job of making you all dumb and numb. We're actually with you always, visually in plain sight more so for those connected and grounded to themselves than your false constructs. Plus, we're like a secret society and you really only know us materially once your breath stops. She said as she sprayed a little of the fresh lavender water I kept on the dresser. It was amazing to watch her tiny hands pick up a bottle nearly half her size. Though the spray bottle was almost as tall as Eden Kira Raiz, she had no problem pushing that nozzle. When the lavender rained down upon her, she smiled and bright golden light sparkled in her mouth. But I'm not dead yet. I whispered almost unsure. Yeah, well, we're losing too many of you, and it's getting crowded where I come from. So, you are our test case, to see what happens if we engage before transition. There's a risk in it, but like I said, you, Betty, are just so sure. And we figure, let's go with the flow. Wait, what do you mean, losing too many of you? It's getting crowded where I come from. And what exactly are you testing? I asked, perplexed. Here's the short of it, what I can tell you anyway. We only champion black and African women loving women, and we have chosen you as our first pre-transition project of sorts. You and me, Batty, we're gonna chat till you, you know, do yourself in. Why do you keep calling me Batty? And what's getting too crowded? Ah, you are paying attention, mother of all miracles. She winked at me and puffed her pipe. Well, on two occasions, you've tried to swap me with that bat. And to me, your decision, well, perhaps justified, is just a little... What's the term of your age? Ah, yes. Bat as a hatter. That's not really of my age, but I know what you're saying. I told her. I was just about to ask again when she said, Stop asking about the two credit reference. I should not have said that. And I'm not going to explain it. She climbed down from the dresser and scanned the room. Then she said, So, how are you going to do it? You know, off yourself? I liked how direct she was. It lacked judgment and shame. Competently, I hope. Oh, child, don't play with me. You won't win. 
How are you going to do it? She said slowly as she refilled her pipe with something that looked remarkably like grass. Not as in cannabis buds, but as in the stuff you mow, like crabgrass. I thought for a moment and exhaled. In the tub with a straight razor. Cold turkey? You gonna take some more of those pills? Pills first. Probably a joint second as I fill the tub. Her eyes opened wide. You're gonna do it in water, eh? Bold choice. I'm curious. Why not hang in for gunshot? Well, too much logistics for either, but also with the history of lynching and shootings of black people, it just didn't feel right. So, even after death, you think you'll be concerned about what other people say and think? She asked. I guess a little. It's more because of the way this world keeps killing us. I want to do this in a way that is more offering-like. I looked down when I said this. Althea, look at me. The use of my name startled me. She said it in a slow and unsettling way. It was almost too familiar, too close. But I looked down at her, and our eyes met. She walked over to the bed where I had yet to move from and reached up, pulled herself deftly up the comforter, onto the mattress, and stood amazingly agile next to me on the bed. She smelled like clean, wet earth after a heavy rain and just a hint of cedar. Her tiny little hand wrapped itself around my finger and then said, The greatest offering you could make is to stay living. And that's not to say we don't know how rigid and dangerous this world is for life and especially black women who turn its notions of normalcy and love upside down. But your life, the way you move, the love with which you embrace everything, it's in complete juxtaposition to the current timeline. You are necessary to move forward everything. It says hate and you love. It says consume with greed and you move with a great generosity of spirit. It says scarcity, and you say abundance. It says men are supreme, and you choose women, always, while balancing your own masculine and feminine energy. It says kill, kill, kill. Choosing to live, 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 aligns with everything that you not only say you are, but is actually your genetic code. I thought about this and said, I'm just so exhausted, so exhausted by this paradigm. It feels like it never lets up. Tears rolled down my cheeks. Miss Indinkira, what do I hold on to when everything seems to just want to pull me down? It's Indinkira Raiz, just Indinkira Raiz. She said as she pulled her handkerchief from underneath her many wrappings and wiped my cheeks. She looked at the tear-soaked fabric in her hands and said, These tears, this salt water from your body, that's what you hold on to. It is a wonderful sign that you still feel in a world that's trying its best to make you a robot, to empty you of everything beautiful and in harmony with our greatest gifts, to make you forget the power of divine love already held within you, and yours for the accessing. Love, I repeated, casting my eyes down. Love doesn't pay the bills. Love doesn't get jobs or food. Love is just a word. She touched my cheek with her bark-covered fingertips and said, And that's exactly what this construct wants you to believe. It is the long con, and it is holding strong with a vengeance right now. Because you and many like you don't actually believe that. Not in your heart of hearts, anyway. You know the true, deeper power of love. You express, explore, and engage in love in the company of women in a way that most of those who do not will never truly understand. Because the construct only lets them see the parts that entail sex. And even that, they don't really get. They just think they need to fight it, change it, kill it. Because it's something that can't be controlled. 
Eden Kira Rais moved closer, almost climbing on my lap and continued. Love is its own life force that thrives when watered. It goes dormant when forgotten, but never dies. It can't be controlled. When you embody love at your core, when you love yourself fiercely, you can't be controlled. You are the greatest threat, and so they wear you down to make you forget. They've built a world telling you you're not worthy without them and their things. The biggest lies ever told are that you have to prove yourself worthy, and their fabricated perception of reality of what is true are the only options. They tell you that through action and consumption, you will fill the hole you feel inside. But you already have everything you need, born perfectly black. Lesbian, woman, you are a masterpiece that evolves and loves. You could be right. I think I can feel those words to be true. But I'm tapped out. I'm ready to move on. I don't know what's next, but it's got to be better than this, I said. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Eden Kira Raiz replied. It sounds like you're going to find out. Do you mind if I stay with you? As long as there are no last-minute heroics, yes, I would like that, I told her. I'm going to start the bath, and I still have some final stuff to do, I said as I eased off the bed. Oh, just leave the box under the bed. Your friends will make sure it's taken care of. You don't need to sanitize the house of your existence. You, my dear, are a find for the next stage and a loss for this one. Leave your legacy true to who you are, a black lesbian, pussy-loving woman. Isn't that what you and your crew always say? I simultaneously laughed and cringed at that. It was like hearing my grandmother say, Pussy. and while funny, odd. Yep, that's what we say, or said anyway. Make yourself at home. I'll be in the bathroom. When the bathtub was full, I undressed and got in. At that moment, I could hear Eden Kiralais's wooden sandals coming down the hall. My breaths began to slow. Just before I closed my eyes, I looked up at those beautiful, deep, almond-shaped eyes and her lavender encircled in marigold irises and smiled. When I opened my eyes again, I was still in water, but it wasn't my tub and this wasn't my bathroom. It smelled and felt a little like watery dirt. It was dark and my bones ached. I reached to push myself up and my hands weren't my hands. They were like branches, but attached to my arms. And my arms, I was hell above. What happened? Where was I? I looked around and nothing was familiar and yet everything felt right and comforting. What was happening? The last thing I remember was being in my bathtub, closing my eyes. I strained to remember more, and sandals, hearing sandals clomping on a hardwood floor. Indinkir Raiz. Indinkir Raiz! I screamed as my insides shook. Where are you? Where am I? I heard the shuffling of wooden sandals on an earthen floor, and that soothed me. Through a little hole on my right entered not eating Kira Raiz, but a very similar looking creature. In a deep, throaty, and commanding voice, she said, My name is Eldor Raiz. You have transitioned. I see eating Kira Raiz could not persuade you to stay above. You are welcome and safe. Though I told her it's getting crowded down here, we're going to have to cultivate more trees. Where am I? I asked. You, my dear, are in the land of Allah, home of the Raiz. We live at the mouth of streams and rivers deep beneath ancestral trees. After some time to decompress, you will start your training. Decompress? Training for what? Shouldn't I be dead? We took the breath you decided to forsake. Like all of us, you transitioned here. This is where all the black, lesbian, pussy-loving women, as you say, who choose to end their breath, go. We become raiz. Over time, you will explore, 
engage and connect to this, our expansive soil, water, and root underworld. You will assist in our endeavors to help our human cistern stay above ground and fight the construct, Elder Raiz explained. She might have noticed I was dumbstruck and at a loss for words, because after a brief glance my way, she continued and said, We've changed tactics. Though I'm still wondering about the name Jasmine Raiz has chosen, Operation In Yo Face is commencing. You'll encounter many black lesbian women needing reminding, and you'll see if and how you can assist them in remembering. You'll do this for as long as you do it, and when you feel ready, you will cycle back into your breath and give your human existence another go. My eyes followed her as she walked around. The small, perfectly round pond I was sitting in sat in the center of a decidedly dark brown space. The room itself was circular and woody. My blurry vision and fuzzy brain were clearing. I was inside a tree trunk, and Elder Raiz had walked in through a small hollow. Welcome home, Althea Raiz. We're sorry to see you, but love you just the same. This tree is one of your great, 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 great mothers. She was one of us as well. Her name is Balsha Raiz. After a few cycles in our form, Elder Raiz waved her hand at herself and then at me, winking in self-love. Bosha Raiz decided to transform into this beautiful shepherd's tree. She will move and grow and be with you as you need, said Elder Raiz. I was in shock. My super great-grandmother was queer? Elder Raiz turned to me and said, most of us are, dear. Most of us are. I just sat in there in my dirt puddle, mouth open. This tree is your home. We are deep inside the earth, and you will remain here for a while to get acclimated to your new being and our ways. As you grow and learn, you'll grow and learn. We all start out with one claw. That's all that's needed, really. Along your travels, you will collect gifts or not. Your choice. She motioned to the left. I looked over. There sat, hugging the back of a rocking chair, more vibrant than ever, my favorite navy and pink flannel striped button down. Stay tuned for the next installment called For Black Lesbian Women When the Paradigm Shifts. Rooted Cosmic Soul Storytime. Unfettered and infinite love and gratitude.